In today's episode, I welcome back Rich Hosek to discuss an author that we have differing opinions on. Uh, the reason I decided to do this, and it's a little bit different than any format you're used to with TRBM, is because a long time ago, I ran into a novel called Bathing the Lamb. I get the title incorrect during the episode, so note that the book is by Jonathan Carroll. I saw one of my friends and a supporter of mine who's read my books and been positive about them, Christopher Jennings Pender, was a big fan of Jonathan Carroll, and so is Rich. I find Jonathan Carroll's work to be lacking, specifically from the prose itself. I don't know, looking back, if it was a specific day that I started reading the book where I was feeling less patient with whatever was in front of my face. Because I pulled the book off of my bookshelf and I took a look through it. Um, it is true that I took a black Sharpie to this book and started crossing out needless words and phrases. I know how awful that is. That makes me a real kind of jerk face. And so I want to front load, even though I say it later in the episode, this is the only time I've ever put a black marker in somebody's book. I was pissed off and I'm not exactly sure I can't get back into that mindset uh, anymore, but that's what I did then. It was a part of who I was. Um, you want to know what else is a part of who I am? I think I start off this episode talking with Rich in kind of a jerky state of mind. And I was listening back to it and editing, and part of me wanted to cut out the whole front bit of the podcast because I sounded like a know-it-all, not my favorite version of me. If I always try to censor the bad parts of me and the parts where I make mistakes and the parts where I fail, then I don't think I'm really representing what it's like to be on this journey to try to be uh, an author who makes a full-time living selling books. It's a hard journey. Uh, inside of me is a judgmental jerk of a person. I'm not always inspiring or inspired. However, I do want to take a moment to at least give you a few examples that I wasn't able to provide during the episode of needless words and phrases. Judge me as you wish. I will stand by my actual taste in what makes good, strong prose. So just flipping to random pages here, uh, on page 16 of Bathing the Lion, Maybe I said Bathing the Lamb earlier. That'd be twice that I get the, the title wrong. Anyways, Bathing the Lion by Jonathan Carroll, page 16, if it's the hardback copy. There is a sentence that says, people born under the sign evidently think they're never wrong about anything. Now, if you're already going to use the hyperbole anything, then you might as well just cut out about anything because people who are born under the sign believe they're never wrong is the identical expression. Nothing is added by saying about anything. So I crossed that out. Um, there are other places where I crossed out something like this. He was absolutely spellbound. Cross out absolutely. You don't need it. He was spellbound. Um, the modifier just doesn't add any information for you. Um, here's another one from the other page on recognizing on page 17. On recognizing the name, he visibly relaxed. This is called filtering. Thank you, Margie Lucas. You are the professor from college that taught me this one. And I am absolutely, positively, one million percent a stickler for getting rid of filtering in anything that I write. And I always notice it in books when I read it. If a character is the point of view character, then you don't need to give me the sensory perception. Just tell me the information. So visibly relaxed. He relaxed. You're going to give me a stronger detail. Ultimately, they'll let me know he relaxed. His shoulders slumped, slouched. His shoulders rolled backward. Whatever it might be. I, I don't necessarily know without having to think about the exact detail. But if you want to give a strong, visible cue in the reader's mind, then you might just say something else like he sighed, he let out a breath of air, anything that lets us know relaxation is happening. Uh, I'm going to go on for a little bit because why not? I, I, I'd really love for you to judge if I'm being overboard on this. On page 18, after listening to her message, he really wanted to avoid her. Cut out, really. He wanted to avoid her. Vanessa was a drama queen. 
of epic proportions. Of epic proportions may be one of the worst phrases that you could possibly write in a book. Here I go being such a jerk. I love it. Uh, I do kind of like this side of me. I don't typically show it. Um, of epic proportions is it's it's a cliched phrase. It's unnecessary. Vanessa was a drama queen. Holds all of the weight that you could possibly need if she's a drama queen. Of epic proportions, I mean, is there even epic proportions? By the time you're queen, you're at the top, right? So you could say she was dramatic. By the time she's a drama queen, okay. Moving on. Dean never suspected anything because they never gave him reason to suspect. This would be a situation where you've already given me the word suspect, so I don't need it to land the sentence. Uh, And you might argue me here and say, well, you can't do a preposition to end a sentence. That's antiquated for one, but for two, you could restructure the sentence if you don't like ending on a preposition and still get rid of the word suspect. So Dean never suspected anything because they never gave him reason to. Works better. Anytime you can cut words out of a sentence, needless words, you increase the forcefulness of the prose. You keep the reader reading. This is unconscious level stuff. When people say that your voice is ruined by paying attention to grammar, they're not thinking about the power that grammar has to clarify your voice, to help you understand how to manipulate words and sentences for your best strength. I think I will stop here, but that that's an example of why I decided to bring out my black marker, because I felt like the prose was overstuffed with needless words. And it bothered me. It bothered me at that time. I don't think I'd do the same thing now. Um, I would notice it. I would not enjoy reading it still. But the story idea, yeah, the story idea is good. And I think, I think that Jonathan Carroll has every book that I've read the synopsis for, great story ideas. I'm jealous of his ideas. Not so much his execution. If you've ever felt bored watching an author read in public... TRBM is the antidote. That reminds me back home where you could catch bugs the size of your face. TRBM is for writers what time lapse was for painters. Guitar solos and spotlight were for bands. And what chainsaws and ice blocks were for sculptors. What does TRBM stand for? The Romantic Bastards Mojo? Totalitarian Russians benefit Moldova? Or Train Robin Baboon Musical? You decide. Um, okay, well, so let's. Uh, I'll keep Kickstarter separate for a second because that's a that's a different thing that I try. Yeah, and I do still see a road to possible success with Kickstarter, but Ammo yeah. actually works. Kickstarter did not work. Kickstarter was the most difficult, humiliating thing that I've ultimately done. Um, and it's great to learn those things in life, right? I mean, you you think that something's going to be great and you realize it's not as great as advertised. I, that said, I do believe that Kickstarter would work. It's just there's a lot more that goes into it that's behind the scenes um, to make a great Kickstarter. And what I really like about Ammo is that it teaches you exactly the process. There is no mystification whatsoever at all. It's do this, do this, do this, and see this result. And if you don't see this result, then do this and try this and try this and try this. And there's literally an endless amount of tinkering that you can do to get the result you want. So for example, I'm running Facebook ads to sell my eBooks right now through the MO program. And I have a return on ad spend of about 89 cents at the moment. So I'm, I am losing money, but only about 11 cents per dollar that I spend. And there's undeniably a point where I'm going to get up to 1.4, 1.5 on my return on ad spend through the program. And then once you hit that point, then you just start to scale and you scale up your ad spend. uh, And and there there becomes a point where you're spending $500 a day, $600, $1,000 a day on, or on, excuse me, I think I've been saying Amazon, Facebook, on Facebook to drive readers into your direct fulfillment. And then at that point, you're making pretty decent money on, on your books. So yeah, I've, I've seen similar programs um, where they, you know, yeah. say, Hey, you got to spend the money uh, to, to make back a little bit, uh, you know, a small percentage on that. This is so you- different than anything you've ever seen before. I've gone through a lot of programs. I've gone through click funnels. I've gone through grow the show. I've gone through um, the, what's that called? Um, self-publishing school with that Chandler Bolt fellow. I've gone through self-publishing, uh, 
formula with Mark Dawson, none of that stuff is even close. It's not even in the same neighborhood. Um, and it's actually relatively cheap for what you're doing. So if you can, you can pay 97 bucks a month to be part of ammo until you get to, I think it's, um, well, I can't remember exactly. It's close to $2,000. It might be $1,700 basically that you pay out and you can pay it out over monthly installments. Um, so, and then all of the different programs that you sign up for to have visibility on exactly what you're doing. So you get this program called Mouseflow. You get another program called Unbounce. Uh, you use Klaviyo for your email um, and you use Shopify for your store. Um, I think there might be one other thing that I'm leaving out. But anyways, all of those things together show you how your customers behave. And then you start to tinker with your website to drive more information toward getting better conversion rates. So for example, you're running a Facebook ad right now, and I don't know what your conversion rate is, but my actual cost per conversion is $5 on mine. And, and yeah, spending. I, I, I just, uh, you know, I throw a Facebook up ad up once in a while um, just because it's like, you know, I, I just want to get this out there and try to get more people driven to my right. Facebook page. I'm not trying to, to gain sales with mine. I'm just trying to get yeah. an audience. So that's, that's the purpose I've been using for that right. um, because I, I'm, I'm really not spending a lot of money on it. I'm just right. Exactly. Pop, right. I'm just throwing it out there saying, Hey, you know mm -hmm. what? Uh, yeah. The audiobook came out. Let me throw up a Facebook ad for that. See if anybody yeah. is interested in audiobooks and then they find my page and maybe like it, follow me and I get someone else to you know, yeah. listen to my stories or something. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I haven't, we haven't been doing any of that type of stuff at scale at all. So Arnold handles the business side of it. Gotcha. Okay. And I don't, I don't track the sales. He's got this, the sales dashboard. Okay. It's all through his account. Yeah. Um, I can say if I go to my author page, I can sort of see what the sales are sure. uh, over historically and stuff like that. I, I do have control over the audio, uh, the yeah. audible uh, sales through ACX. And, um, but you know, that's, that's not a huge amount right now either. Right. And I, I you know, I, I may, it may be rationalizing it, but I just kind of feel like, I need to have those that six book library in yeah. place before I start really investing in the marketing. Because one of the things I hear all the time is like, you know, you, you use your books to sell your books. Yeah. And so if you've only got a couple of books, you don't have anything to sell. So if you invest on people getting into your sphere, if you get an audience mm -hmm. and you don't have other stuff for them to buy, then you lose them. Yeah, I think that there's some truth to that. I mean, I definitely think the more books you have, the better you're going to do. But what I'm finding out with Ammo is that I'm I'm running right now a deal where you buy, and I think you bought one, so you kind of know the deal, but you get yeah. the first book and it is delivered to you right away. And then you get the pre-order for the second and the third book. So as soon as those are published, they'll just drop right into your device. And it's actually like an email reminder, hey, this guy still exists. You should read the follow-up book. And so everybody's buying kind of knowing what they're getting. And I have the benefit of pre pre-sales without having to really do like a pre-order campaign. So I've already sold somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 copies of my book too, uh, with another, what's it, four months to go before launch. And if I can scale by that time, I might have, you know, several thousand copies of that book sold before it even launches. And that's just the eBooks. So yeah, I, nice. I really, really like it. I think it's a good program. I, I, can understand that not everybody has the same thing, but I would push back and say, I think that if you know that you have a three book package coming, and especially in your case, knowing you have rainy day coming like in kind of a, almost an infinite iterations, it's a really good program for you. I'm only talking to you about it because I'm pretty high on it. Um, I've tried a lot of things. I get nothing. There's no kickbacks in yeah. this program. Like I, you don't, they don't, they don't throw me a hundred bucks if I get somebody to join the program. No, no, and this, this is one of the reasons why I enjoy listening to your podcast. Yes. I mean, from the beginning, it's 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 always been kind of like following your journey yeah. through the whole process of not only being an author, but being a marketer. Yeah. And I know you're, you're kind of like, you know, I, let me get more toward the 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 reader focus type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you still, you know, give us those episodes where, oh, hey, I've been trying this. So I want to talk to this person about what they've done and so forth, because uh, I think if you, you you're you're attacking it from two sides, then mm -hmm. you've got that you're capturing me for that but i mean i'm, I'm 
I've, I've got another story coming out this weekend based off of one of your prompts too. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, that's cool. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad those things are, are, are helpful to you as well. And that's, I mean, that really was my desire in moving it over is that it would be a benefit to somebody who's just a reader and wants to hear a fun story told in a kind of different way, but also for writers to use those prompts. I find myself yeah. being really fascinated by um, some of the prompts and, you know, not, not, because I created them. Actually, in most cases, I'm borrowing pretty heavily from other stuff that I hear while I may be yeah. listening to a podcast and doing some like whatever kind of work. I'll be like, oh, that's a cool idea. A lot idea. of them go very dark, Jody. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <don't> they? <laughs> <laughs> they really do. I mean, the 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 first one, it may have been the first one you did uh, with the the person comes home and uh, sees the drugs in the daughter's drawer. Oh, and- yes, exactly. Yeah, Heather, that was a that was a really fun episode. She is she is a really dynamic person. I uh, had oh, yeah, pretty- we become friends on Twitter now, too, because I nice. kind of hooked up with her after that episode, after I posted uh, the story I wrote off of that. Oh, nice. Did you hear that one? Nick? I've got it. I've got it queued up here pretty, pretty shortly. So I'm I'm excited. It, it's, it's one of those things. It's like you guys were going got to one point. Yeah. And, and when you were discussing where she says, so what, what would you do when you see the dead body? And she, her response was, well, he would call the police. Right? Yeah. And and my response was, no, he's not going to call the police because he'll get his daughter in trouble. And so like it went off into a whole different story from that point on, which I thought was fantastic. And it just, you know, I basically sat down after I listened to her and wrote that story. And um, I, I, I liked the way it came out. And it was just like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. And so like the, the shark one is the other one that sort of inspired me too. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. The shark the shark episode, I'm so, so glad that I just had the harebrained idea to do this co-host thing because I think it was 100% necessary to have Chris there for that like comedic relief that we got. It it completely saved that episode. I felt like I couldn't figure out how to turn it into a compelling listener environment. And then Chris throws in the manatee and you're like, we're off to the races. So I really enjoyed that. Well, great. Chris is an interesting guy too. I like, what, like following him on Twitter as well. He's got a very interesting yes. life. He has a super interesting life. I've become pretty, pretty darn close with him, um, which is, a, I, I don't think I ever would have assumed that I would meet real people like you or like Chris through Twitter that I would end up being close with and share like personal parts of my life with not, it's not all just shop talk. Um, yeah, he's, he's zany kind of fellow. We are on to talk about Jonathan Carroll. And this is because I have such strong feelings about, I think the title of the the book is The Lion and the Lamb. Um, If not, it's close enough that you'll get there with a Google search. Uh, I I picked up the book and I think I've told listeners this before. What I tend to do if I'm going to be really exploratory reading is I go to the Friends of the Omaha Public Library book sale. Shout out to FOPL. You guys are amazing. Um, And Anybody in the Omaha area can donate to any of our branches, and those books make their way to the one library branch, and in the basement, they have a book sale every single week where people can just walk in, browse the shelves. There's dozens of hard, or like, you know, hundreds, thousands of hardcovers, softcovers, everything you can think of, and the whole bottom floor of this library is dedicated to the sale. Uh, you can get copies, hardback copies for a uh, buck fifty. So it's just like, wow, this is crazy. And you can get remainder stuff from the library that they've gotten rid of for a quarter. So I find myself going and picking up, you know, 20 books in a haul. (laughs) I had a bookstore when I went to college. It was one of these places. It was just a small two-story shop, crammed full of books. You had like, you know, the width of the aisle was like one person and books towering like all the way to the top of the ceiling. Yeah. And man, I just, I spent so much time there just looking for new books, new finds and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That, and also the, the, the college bookstore where I would look for the latest paperbacks. And that's how I discovered Jonathan Carroll. Okay. So both of us discovered him through used books and just kind of like working our way toward, toward reading him. And we had uh, dramatically different experiences. So one thing I want to be really careful to respect every writer out there, unless you're just absolutely a lazy writer, in which case get with the game. But there's not too many lazy writers who end up writing full novels. I think there are some uninformed uh, authors, but I'm going to say with all of that, that for me, when I read Jonathan Carroll, there was so much extraneous words that it became a, a burden to me. I, I I got out my black highlighter and or my black Sharpie and started literally crossing out sections of words that were unnecessary. Wait, to the wait, point, what do you consider unnecessary? Well, and I wish I had the copy. I'm almost tempted to like pause this and go run and get the copy to give you ideas. But like, um, 
the fact that would be a, a phrase that would be unnecessary. You know, the fact that blah, 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 or um, a, like a dense number of adjectives or a dense number of adverbs, uh, adverbs that are obvious, things of that nature. I hmm. am passionate about the language, but usually if I read a book, I don't think that the language will distract me until it gets to a point where I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, this is phrased so much more clumsily than it needs to be. And that was my experience of that book. The story, because of that, didn't surface off the page, but I'm finding that that you and another guy I really admire, uh, his name's Christopher, not Talon that we were just talking about, um, both have just glowed about Jonathan Carroll to the point where I want to pick up another book and see if it's a writing style thing that I'm just not going to connect with, or if it was a mood, you know, I mean, it could be any and, number of things. And here's, the, here's the thing with me and Jonathan Carroll too. So I, I read Land of Laughs, I think it was in 82 or 83. And it, I think it had just come out in paperback because I was, I was going through the, the shelf of my bookstore, right? I was like, you know, uh, Piers Anthony, Isaac Asimov, mm -hmm. working through the bees. And then I got to uh, Jonathan Carroll and I saw the book and I saw the title and I thought, looked at it reminded me a lot of lewis carroll yeah I'm a big fan of him i, I just read like a, an annotated an edition of uh alice looking glass and alice in wonderland mm -hmm. and i so i saw this book and i said well this looks like fun and i picked it up and it was one of those books you read it cover to cover because it's just like yeah it is so captivating so my experience with him was i was not distracted by anything in there um i just reread it again this week in preparation for this because uh the the audiobook has come out recently yeah uh, via, via neil gaiman oh. so neil gaiman uh produced an audiobook through his series neil gaiman presents wow and, okay and i was like okay this is interesting that neil gaiman likes him i to yeah. be honest i haven't read i can't remember anything i've read of neil gaiman's i've seen a bunch of the movies mm. but now i want to go read neil gaiman because he likes jonathan carroll <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> Yeah, I, I love those kind of connections. I definitely swim in that water. Now, it's it's funny because Neil Gaiman does not, from a prose level, uh, trip any wires for me. I read happily yeah. along. I'm sure there's like a word here or there I might do differently, but we're all writers, right? Um, yeah. However, I thing, have read... Oh, go the ahead. The thing too with Jonathan Carroll is, is, so when I read his book, there wasn't another Jonathan Carroll book for me to read. Oh, okay. And so he kind of fell off my radar for a while. I think oh. I picked up uh, Bones of the Moon mm -hmm. years later, and I... Don't remember that one as well. Yeah. Uh, Land of Laughs just stuck with me. It just sort of grabs a hold of you in a, in a way, because I hadn't read a book like it before. Mm -hmm. It was, I, uh, some people call it modern fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got some light horror elements to it. Um, and it just kind of, the, the, the characters he built and the world mm -hmm. he created, because it, it's, it's a story about a... Um, a, an English teacher who wants to write a biography about his favorite child's author. Hmm. And so the interesting thing for me is that he had to create a world where there exists this literary body of work that this author has created that is the best stuff ever written. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do that? How do you, how, for, you can't write all the greatest books ever written and then write a book about it. Right. So you have to sort of come at it around the edges and he does it so artfully. He mm. creates these character names, he creates these situations, these book titles and so forth. And uh, it just, it's, it's a, um, I think it's a masterclass in world building for, for mm. light fantasy. Yeah. And also for literary, uh, writing about a literary figure. Mm. It, it reminds me of um, uh, World According to Garp. Okay. I know like, of it. I've read it, a lot of his other, other stuff, uh, Prayer for Owen Meany, but I have not read uh, The World According to Garp, actually. But. In that novel, he has mm -hmm. a couple of the short stories that Garp writes, mm -hmm. and they have to be like you know really good, grand yeah. short stories to sort yep. of sell the rest of the novel. Mm -hmm. And they, you know they did the same thing in the movie with um, Robin Williams. Uh, you know he, he's telling some of the stories, and they kind of like created something different for the movie than they did in the book. Mm -hmm. But it it it's one of those situations like you have to create a story that is going to match up with the reputation of the character that you've created. Yeah. And so Jonathan Carroll doesn't give you anything more than a couple of snippets, little couplets mm -hmm. of, of glimpses from the, the books that, you know, everybody is like glowing about. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. fascinated about this, this English teacher says this, these books were like his obsession when he was a child. Yeah. And so that kind of grabbed me too at the time. Mm 
I was like, wow. You know, because he's, he's writing about this Lewis Carroll type author who had created this great body of work. And I don't want to get into me in a lot of spoilers. Maybe towards sure. the end, we can do like a, hey, spoiler alert kind of sick thing. To <laughs> yeah, talk about the yeah, end of the definitely. Book you're interested. I always but, have the I always have the rule with books that if it's been out for more than a decade, spoilers are fair game because if you haven't read it already, <laughs> too bad. Well, that's for you. A, that's a thing too. I mean, because because this the audio version just came out, I think in the last couple of years. So it's it's one of those things. It's like people are discovering him because of that, mm. and I'd hate to spoil it because this, it is such a good book. Yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those ones too. It's like um, uh, I, I, I mentioned mentioned on Twitter that I have mm-hmm. a first edition signed copy. My, my uh, Arnold had, and his wife actually got it for me for my birthday one year. They had come across it mm. at a bookstore. So it's a secondhand thing. It wasn't signed to me, but still, yeah. it's kind of neat to have. Uh, it was, and it was, apparently, he lives in Austria. He's lived in Austria since 1974. Oh, wow. Okay. So, but he, you know, he grew up in New York and he's, you know, writing a novel set in America was not a problem for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is set in like, uh, you know, early, late 70s. So it's like, I guess uh, from today's point of view, it is historical fiction at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, it's really crazy. Think of it that way. I mean, yeah. that's when I grew up, and it's like, okay, I lived okay. in historical fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it is. But again, too, it was like it was one of those situations where it was his first book, and I I caught it when it came out in paperback, mm-hmm. eighty two, eighty three, I think, mm-hmm. and there wasn't another Jonathan Carroll book for me to read until I came across him again, browsing crown books mm-hmm. uh, when I was out in California. And that, that was bones of the moon. I know I have that book, but I can't remember what it's about. Huh. So that's and, another one too. It's like, I, and I think after I read bones of the moon, I kind of like said, eh, it kind of fell off the Jonathan Carroll wagon. Okay. I said, you know what? I've got land of laughs mm-hmm. and that's always going to be special for me. It's just one of those things we, we yeah. t- talked previously to about, um, uh, Lord Fowles Bain and Stephen Donaldson. Yes, that's right. He's another one too. I read in college that just kind of like, but he, but at that point, the whole trilogy of that first Chronicles of Thomas Covenant was out, so I was able to sort of like Binge really through. grab a hold of him, and and then I yeah. was looking for the next one that came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still, I, I would, I would like to, I think, read again his work because I did think that Lord Fowles Bain was pretty great. I still, as we discussed before, have some kind of like feelings about the rape scene, um, which is interesting because this is a tangent. I have uh, an audiobook reader that I believe I'm signed up with. I'm not going to say her name just quite yet because I, we haven't signed a contract, but I think she's good to move forward with me. And she did need to know trigger warnings. And so I've been actually, there's a review up on Amazon um, and I've been pretty vocal anytime that people ask about this, there is a rape scene in my book. Uh, and so it's funny that I'm angry at Lord Fowles Bane rape scene, but yet I have a rape scene in my book. It's, it's like, I just think I did it better. That's uh, that's the arrogance of an author, or, or at least the you, arrogance. Of you know, reader. and I was thinking about that because when you first told me that you you read it and it was hard to get through it, I, I my mind in a different direction because I always struggled yeah. with vocabulary. But um, afterwards, I realized that, you know, that was what you're talking about, because after we talked about it, actually, I went back and I reread those books again. That's funny. I'm actually on, on the third Chronicles of Thomas Covenant right now, rereading those. Yeah. Uh, that's a five book uh, collection, which is just uh, just yeah. masterful. Uh, and, and the thing about him is that he's completely original fantasy. It's not mm-hmm. elves and dwarves mm-hmm. and wizards. Yeah. It's completely original stuff. But the, I, I guess the reason why that didn't affect me so much is, I mean, I I grew up, you know, learning English and we we learned about all of the, the Greek mythology and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yes. Where the gods were going around. Raping people raping on the, the, people the, the <laughs> it, was kind of, it was kind of like, oh, it's Wednesday. It's rape day. Yeah, I not, might not have like to cut was, this out of the podcast. But. <laughs> not, not, that it, not that I felt like it was a normal thing to do at all. I don't want to say but that. I'm, it was normalized disclaimer. in the sense that that happens in the world. And so and in literature, too. Yes. And you venerate the gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods. And so in that sense, you can actually root for a character who does something despicable. That is actually the line for me, though, is had he either paid uh, for his acts, which I think you maybe suggest that he does in later books, um, or had it been a, an evil person committing rape, those kind of things when I read them in literature don't bother me because they are part of the real world. But when your hero does it and then seemingly experiences no real consequences, that's where I got hung up on that particular one. Yeah. I think it's 
though the the way that Donaldson sort of sells the fundamental aspect of that character being an unbeliever. Mm-hmm. It's Thomas Covenant, the unbeliever. He doesn't right. believe that anything around him is actually real, that it's actually happening. Right. It's yeah. all a yeah. dream. So mm-hmm. what are the consequences of doing something like that in a dream? Yeah. I want to pass that off to Sigmund Freud to to talk about to talk about the <laughs> psychological consequences of like it, in your mind him, how far do you go? It does tear him apart internally. I mean, he he re, he regrets it, and but mm-hmm. everybody is like in the in the book, if you read the first book, everybody sort of like looks past it because he is fulfilling a prophecy mm-hmm. that they has a greater purpose than anything that that and, could equate to that. And yeah, I think that that's a really powerful. Yeah, that's a really powerful question. What lengths will we go to to forgive somebody who is fulfilling our our hopes and dreams? If they're going to fulfill our hopes and dreams, uh, is that enough for us to uh, excuse despicable behavior? And I wonder too if 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 that you know if younger people reading that picking that book up for the first time would have even a more uh, react a larger reaction to that than you did, and just yeah. put it aside right at that point, and then yes. even going further. I would like to know. I would like to know that. I wonder if I can find uh, more more people out there who are younger even than I am and, and uh, see what their responses are. Let's double back. So I think one thing that we kind of left a, an open thread to that I want to explore a little bit is we mentioned the connection between Jonathan Carroll and Neil, Neil Gaiman. Gaiman. I never know how to pronounce his name. I should probably just listen to him pronounce his I, own name. I say, I, I've i always heard it as Gaiman. I don't know. I, I think I have two. And then there was some snooty person in an MFA that was like, it's actually Gaiman. Same with Jonathan Latham or Lethem. Uh, you know, it looks like it should be easy. So what I was going to say, one is Coraline is, I think, more of a children's book. But that by Neil Gaiman is amazing. That's such a good story. And the film adaptation of it is surreal how great it is mm. uh, it's made for children but i could watch it over and over and over again the theme of the story is just perfect his writing his stories typically fail for me um his writing is fine it's passable to me but his stories don't like american gods just didn't get there for me and a couple of other things that i've read by him have failed sort of the draw you in suck you into the world kind of test whereas jonathan carroll i've read the synopsis getting ready for this podcast i read the synopsis to all of his novels and i was like i want to read that 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 he is like the idea of the story this most recent one that he has out that a guy gets to kind of try out his lives and like it's almost like a choose your own adventure story and i've always wanted to do that and i thought that is such an amazing idea and so i wanted to go out and get that book but i was like i swear i know his name well this was the first one that kind of started this story because Christopher had told me about it, but um, I'm left in this position where I'm like, do I want to dive into a book that's so promising and then be frustrated because the language is a barrier to me? Um, So that's where I'm going to stop and just let you kind of reflect on those thoughts a little bit, and then we'll move to the next phase. (laughs) Yeah, and it it is. I'm certainly going to go back and and start looking uh, through his books too, to sort of see which ones I want to take a look at, because Mm -hmm. I haven't, I have not read anything of his since bones of the moon and oh, wow. um, okay and it, it basically just because he doesn't write very frequently i mean there's sometimes mm-hmm. three or four years between his books mm-hmm. and so it's not like one of those authors like a stephen king or you know yeah. Patterson or, or you know guys right. put out multiple books a year where you can sort of almost subscribe to them right <laughs> and say, exactly. oh, it's time for the next yep. book from this guy and so you know which is what i hope to be but yeah it's so I, I I lost track of him and it okay. became kind of like one of those things. It's like, okay, well, I remember he wrote this great book, but I'm, I just wasn't aware of anything that came after because one things changed a lot in the whole book buying thing. Right. Mm-hmm. In college, I was going to the used bookstore. I was going to the college bookstore looking for the latest paperbacks. I was uh, joined the science fiction and fantasy um, book club, the mail order one where you could get like, you know, these sort of like cheap, uh, got pulp copies of mm-hmm. uh, books and kind of a semi hard co- cover version. And uh, so I, I accumulated a bulk of my library at that point. And then mm-hmm. when I moved out to Hollywood to get into television, I did a lot less reading. I did, I did a lot of book buying, but a lot yeah. <laughs> less reading because yep. yeah. I was focused yeah. on watching TV because that was the craft I was, I was trying to master at that point. And so Jonathan Carroll just fell off my radar completely. But when you sure. put that tweet out, 
you know, which book should I read next? I I know I we had already spoken about uh, mm-hmm. Lord Falls Bane, which my is my usual go to, mm-hmm. and I said, well, Land of Laughs. If you haven't read Land of Laughs yet, I think it's it's one of those things that is masterfully done. Mm-hmm. It's it's a short book. It's has just as much story as it needs to have. And it's got an epilogue that is very satisfactory mm. as the, the story ends. And then you, you, you go on and find out how he takes advantage of what he has gained from his experience. Mm. And wow. It was just like, how did he do that? That was just for, for in, maybe it was because I was still young at the time mm. I was in college and I'm like in awe by yeah. the people. And I'm just like, I'm just sort of getting the seeds in my mind. Like, I think I want to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and his, that book, you know, when I read Stephen Donaldson said, I'm never gonna be able to write like Stephen Donaldson. I don't mm-hmm. have that background. He has got such a rich vocabulary and mm-hmm. master mastery of the language and you know, the hero's journey, all that kind of stuff. He just has sort of like been studying that his whole life. Whereas mm-hmm. I've kind of like stumbled through grade school and high school, reading the stuff I was supposed to read consuming things like, you know, Hardy Boys and Three Investigators and all these other little uh, juvenile book series and so forth. And it wasn't until I got college and I got serious about it that I started appreciating literature and started appreciating stories from there that from that point of view, right? As from a mm-hmm. writer's point of view instead of a reader's point of view. Yeah. And so reading this book and saying, this is this is reachable, right? I, I can I, I understand this book. It doesn't escape my attentions. It, it, the characters are have some some level of contrivance to make the story work, but it's believable. Yeah. Oh man, you just made me want to go on a tangent that I'm not going to go. But my wife and I went and saw Ant Man, uh, Quantumania last night, and I will say in brief, I thought it was an amazing movie with uh, exactly what you just said. There was some contrivance in it that I just got a little bit frustrated with. But boy, I, I think maybe because so many people had pitched it so low, uh, it exceeded my expectations and completely changed the way that I viewed it. But I love the movie. Um, I would be a terrible movie critic because I love every movie. You know what? I'm actually so glad you said that because I'm talking with my wife as we're leaving the theater and we got super nitpicky about stuff. And so like we probably spent 20 minutes of the drive home. We live out in, in the boonies. So to go to a theater is an hour drive for us. Um, but like as we're driving back 20 minutes, just picking it to shreds. And I looked over at her and I was like, and despite all of this, I loved it. I loved it. You know, <laughs> so and I, I said, I think something's broken with me because I love pretty much every movie I see. It's very rare that a movie... Yeah pisses me off and it has to get to that level of like, I'm pissed off. You cheated that I I don't like it. Um, so I completely understand where you're coming from. Do you feel that way about books to a degree? Do most books satisfy you or are there more books that don't work for you than movies? You know, uh, I think, I think I'm a little bit more critical of books than I am mm-hmm. of movies, mm-hmm. uh, especially when it comes from an established author. Um, like there's, there's been some Patterson books that he's co-written, co-written, Right. With other writers that I just was like, well, was this really worth it? Even some of his, his, his other novels too. He like, he just throws in circumstances and contrived things in some of the Alex cross books that I'm just like, really? Yeah. Um, I, I felt this way too lately about Stephen King. Really? Stephen King. I feel like he's phoning it in some days. Sleeping Beauties. I was just really disappointed by that one. Ooh, okay. Sleeping Beauties was was bad. I'll agree with you there. And I haven't read anything else by Owen, but I want to. I want to, um, in my heart of hearts, blame blame Owen for for what that book. I guess was. you. I guess you could. Yeah, but but still, <laughs> you might be right. Uh, I am reading a fairy tale right now, and it's starting out really great i will <laughs> this is the podcast is not going the way i mean it to <laughs> <laughs> so it's my fault <laughs> yeah he's been doing too many old man stories recently where you've got the old man mentor teaching the young kid thing so that's the setup in fairy tale right now and i, uh, I think i'm okay with it but it does start to feel a little bit like ah i've seen stephen king do this and um mr harrigan's phone is kind of a similar thing you, you know curmudgeonly probably rich wise but uh you know hard to access kind of thing so yeah there there might be he might be retraveling territory a lot and he might be thinking about mortality because uh if you and think about a authors, legacy with his sons yes and creating a legacy with his sons i do actually think that that's on his mind quite a bit and so i think that's yeah. coming out in his fiction he's still doing it well for me his his writing alone would be yeah. one of those things where at a sentence level i am so 
satisfied with with how he he writes it is it it's it's a uh, the thing i admire more, most about him is that the not the story but the characters are written densely and that mm-hmm. you learn a lot about them in a scene mm-hmm. intentionally but you it's you're also moving the story forward and so mm-hmm. he's very economical in that sense and so i do appreciate that yeah but um i i i am on the the uh the 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 wagon that um i thought the end of the dark tower was a little self-indulgent yeah i've heard some folks say that and i i enjoyed it fairly well and i enjoyed the fact that there could be a loop for it i felt like that was a case of him participating with film and saying let's make this into a series of movies and you get to do anything you want with it because you can start from the beginning of the second go round. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do um so I I certainly liked the first few though the lobstrosities. Oh yeah. In, uh, yes, you know. yes. The, I mean the the gunslinger was you know fantastic. Yeah. But it it just felt like s- some of the books were not really connected. They just sort of had an idea for some weird thing and said, oh, I'll just throw it in the mm. the Dark Tower series. Yeah. And it was just like okay, these really. I mean he he managed to connect them in the end. It's kind of like when mm-hmm. Asimov connected the Foundation and Robot series mm. together. Yeah. Um which my, my son is into right now, which is kind of cool. Nice. Um, and, uh, but yeah, and a friend of mine, she got to the, to the last book of the dark tower. She burned, literally burned her Stephen King library and said, I will never read anything. He ever writes again. Well, she was dramatic. so disappointed by that. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that also shows there. how much I'm she loved there. the, yeah. It yeah. shows how much she loved his work before that, that you could yeah. respond that intensely, or she could just go see a, uh, you know, better help or something like that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'm, I'm truly kidding. <laughs> I have not burned a book so far. Maybe someday I will burn a book. Uh, let's, oh, I can't. No. Yeah. No, I know. I'm, I'm being partly facetious. I have a copy of Good to Great. It's a nonfiction book that was super duper popular. I bought at the library book sale. And occasionally I would make a TikTok for a little while where I would use a, uh, like I'd rip out a page of that book and like blow my nose with it and be like, see, even if you don't read books, they have lots of other utility or rip a page out and wipe my mouth at the dinner table. Um, and, you know, just trying to be silly, but they never caught on. And it was actually a lot of work to try to make this. So I just stopped doing it. But uh, what I want to talk about next in relation to Jonathan Carroll and our um, hugely different reads on him is, I think, the more personal aspect. So this is specifically for the authors who are listening right now, which I think is still most of my audience. Putting The Nine Lives of Marva DeLong High out into the world for me was an interesting moment for so many reasons. Uh, I had a a literary agent with it. I thought that it was going to go the traditional publishing route. I felt like it was the first step into the wide world of publishing and celebrity. Uh, I'm sure all of us have had our dreams dashed, but then self-publishing it, um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't wonder, was it truly just not good enough to make the cut? Um, And I really doubt my own writing. I doubt my storytelling abilities. I doubt my pacing. I doubt my character development. I doubt my sentencing, all of that kind of stuff. And when I have struggles to sell as many copies as I want to, or I can't figure out how to get above that uh, return on ad spend that we talked about at the beginning of the episode. Is it because the book is just not good? Is the cover wrong? What is the problem here? And I wanted to hear from you who has written several books. How much does doubt play a role in in what you're doing? And uh, how much do you believe the negative reviews compared to the positive reviews? Well, first of all, let me tell you, the cover is, is great. I love your cover. Thank for, you. Uh, nine lives. Um, and God, that's an interesting question. So I think I'm coming at it from my history as a television writer. I've been mm-hmm. validated, right? Okay. I've, I've gotten TV shows produced on air that you can buy them on DVD. And it's like, okay, I, you know, I'm on imdb.com, right? You can mm-hmm. look me up and, you can see that I was a television writer. I had a career. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I reached a, that, that pinnacle there where I was a head writer on a TV show. Yeah. And so I've had that validation as a writer. So moving to novels, I didn't have as much insecurity or doubt about, mm-hmm. can I tell a story? Uh, it, was like, okay. it was more like, can I write a novel? Yeah. So the storytelling part of it, I had, had dialogue. I was very confident in writing a novel especially a mystery novel because 
I had never written any really sort of mystery stuff. I'd written a couple of TV cop shows that were, you know, had a, you know, a mystery in it, but it was all very carefully plotted out ahead of time. And you had like a lot of producers and other writers to collaborate with. So here in, in this particular case where I'm writing these mystery stories, it's like, okay, am I writing a mystery that people will get to the end and go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Because mm-hmm. that's what I want, right? Yes, and I, that's, absolutely. I can do that. And so when I sent it off to my beta readers, and that's the reaction I got, I think that erased most of the doubt. Mm-hmm. I think there's always going to be doubt. It's like, like, is this one as good as the last one? And I just wrote the second one, and people said, I like this one better than the first one. I'm like, going, really? I'm like, because I, yeah. I didn't think it was as good. Yeah. I, I thought that the mystery in the first one was a lot better than the, in the second one. But mm-hmm. uh, the subject matter in the second book, I, I really fell in love with because I got to imagine uh, what it would be like to be a ghost. Yeah. And I know you talk about this a lot in the podcast too, because you love ghost stories. I do. And so that's, that's something that working with a parapsychologist too, is like, I have to be really attentive to what are the actual recorded verified stuff that they actually can call upon. And right. as you, you know, we had a conversation with Lloyd, uh, how this, that story was based on an experience he had where he was talking to somebody who was actually in communication in real time with a ghost. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the doubt, man, certainly the, 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 the I, mean, I, I do all my own covers and stuff like that. We, we keep our production costs down low. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I like the cover, but mm-hmm. is it grabbing people's attention? Yeah. It's I your like, covers are so on brand. Um, I, yeah. I mean, like immediately you see the cover and you know what genre you're working with. Uh, do I feel like your cover would win an award? I'm not sure, but they're they're good, yeah. and I I actually didn't know you did drone covers, so I I think that that's the snuff test that you need to pass. Is this they looked professionally designed to me? Thank you, but it it, it is, and it, it's like yeah, that's the thing too. Like when we started off to do a series, I said yeah, I I want to brand these. I want them to yeah. look like they come came from the same book series because that's the thing I hate is like when you get a book series and yes. like the first two books are one way and the third book has something else. Yep. And it's not until they go into paperback that you get sort of a cohesive cover design or something mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's, and it's, it's everything I, I write in, in that case, sort of like when I get to the novel part and you're reaching that 75,000 word mark and you're like going, is this too much? Is this not enough? Have I yeah. laid enough clues for the reader to really enjoy this when they get to the end where they buy the twist that I've set up? Mm-hmm. And that that kind of stuff you can't erase. You can't really sort of erase all of that doubt because there's going to be someone I haven't met them yet, but I will. Who will say, "Yeah, no, I, I didn't buy that at all. Hmm. I didn't get that. I don't, I yeah. don't get it." Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if your first fifty reviews are all four and five stars, and people rave about you, and then you get the one, um, how much? How much does the one hit you? If I were Jonathan Carroll listening to this podcast, uh, which if you are Jonathan, um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry <laughs> that I've been so tough on you. <laughs> I would I would measure his response or I'm imagining being him. I would be upset if I was concerned about my prose uh, mm. and I would kind of shrug it off and be like, what an elitist douchebag Jody is. Um, <laughs> he's putting black ink on my book. How dare he? That is the only book I've ever done that with. Uh, so well, yeah, there was something. Now, now I'm thinking about it too. I don't, I don't know what the, what the point of view in that novel that you read was. Was it third person or first person? Do you remember? So as I recall, it was an interesting experimental setup where it was shifting first person points of view. If I remember correctly, it actually has multiple first person points of view. Um, yeah. So Land of Laughs is first person too. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of little quirks that he throws in. For example, mm-hmm. the character tends to exaggerate. You know, he goes to get change mm-hmm. for the payphone and he gets 4,000 quarters. Which <laughs> obviously he didn't get 4,000 yeah. quarters, right? He's waiting for a freight train and there's 738 cars on this freight train. But obviously there's <laughs> right. a freight train that long. Yeah. And so throughout the book, you see these little exaggerations that this character just throws in. Nobody remarks mm-hmm. on it. Yep. Nobody, it doesn't hang any sort of lantern on it at all. But reading it, for probably the fifth or sixth time now, I just noticed it. Oh, interesting. Like, yeah. I was just like, wow, I was, I didn't notice that before that he, this character is like prone to these exaggerations. It doesn't really mean anything to any other part of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just it, a richness of character. 
it, it is a richness of character and it, you know, you can sort of make a connection to, you know, the, the point, the, the point of the, of the, the character is that he has to write a biography of this guy. And I just want to put spoiler alert out there now. If, if you yeah. want to read Land of Laughs and you don't want to hear a spoiler, uh, stop the podcast now, go read the book and then come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I endorse that message. <laughs> All right. So uh, he goes to the hometown of this writer, meets his daughter, and she has not allowed anyone to do a biography on him for years, for whatever reason she has. She's very protective. And he says, well, I'll give it a try. And he goes there and uh, he starts the people in the town and this and the, the daughter sort of like very welcoming to him, contrary to what his expectations were. And she keeps on hinting, well, if you if you write your book, this would be a great thing to put in it and so forth. And then finally she gets around saying, well, yes, go ahead and start it. And they make a deal like you write a chapter if I like it, then we'll go ahead with it and so forth. And so but the what he discovers later on is that the point of writing this biography is to write it as well as um, the author um, Marshall France has written his books because it turns out and here's the big spoiler. So if you, if you ignore my first spoiler, don't <laughs> ignore this one. It turns out that the people in the town are all literary creations of Marshall France. Mm. He started writing uh, he, he after writing children's books, he started writing a novel for his daughter based on people he knew in town. And he wrote a scene where one woman dies. And then that, that day, the woman dies. Wow. And he realized that he was actually writing the architect of the town. Happening, right. Yeah. And so he started experimenting and he started creating new people in the town until mm. the town was almost exclusively populated by his fictional creations. And he, he made it so that they can't, if they ever try to leave, they'll die. And people oh, come wow. in, they'll be sick. And, and so it's kind of like made this own little enclave and then he dies unexpectedly. Mm. And so over the years, but he, before he died, he wrote like a history of the town going to the year 3014. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he just like wrote every single major life event for happens for everybody in the town who's born, dies, married, children, all that kind of stuff. But then things start going wrong. Um, you know, a, a boy gets hit by a truck, but it's the wrong person driving the truck and so forth. And so they're desperate to have this writer write the biography of Marshall France to bring him back to life. So he oh. has to write it in a way that is going to um, be as good as Marshall France was. And so mm. this, this author has a very unique history. His father was a famous uh, actor. And he's uh, paired up with a, uh, a woman who does his research, who's also very obsessed with Marshall France. And they come into town and they start writing it. And then things start settling down, right? All these weird mm -hmm. things that were happening start normalizing to what Marshall France had originally written. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the other cool thing about it is that, you know, people turn into these uh, bull terrier dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Just for random points. He's like uh, he's staying at this house. And this woman has a bull terrier and the dog is on his bed one, one day and is like dreaming, you know, like dog dreams do and he starts talking in his sleep yeah. and he, and that's, and that's, that I remember is the point when I was reading this book, when I'm just like, okay, I can't put this book down until I fin find out what happens because yeah. it's about halfway through the book. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, reading through it, you, 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 there's enough to carry you into the book that, that far. But when you get to that point, it's like, okay, I'm not going to sleep until I finish this book. Yeah. Because it just from there, it just kind of like, what the hell is going on? And you find out all these secrets and stuff like this. Now, I'm not going to do a spoiler for the very end because mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant. I think it's one of the best endings to a book um, in this genre that I've ever read. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons why it made such an impact on me. And that's why, again, too, why I, after I finished it, I almost immediately went back and reread it again to sort of pick up the clues oh, along the way yeah. that take you to that conclusion. And sort of make sure I didn't miss anything. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a powerful thing. And it's it's um, a slightly different than maybe the sixth sense. Well, I guess the sixth sense could be one. We just talked about, that, about this recently. And, yeah, I heard that uh, one. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that that movie was probably was about the top of, of uh, Shyamalan's 
mountain. Um, and so maybe that is one you go back and you watch to see kind of how he lays all the clues down. But a lot of times a book that has that kind of a twist doesn't like, or, or a film doesn't have the richness the second time through. So that's really cool that he achieved uh, the, the, the level that he did that you went back and, and thought, I have to read all of this again. Yeah. Well, the thing with the sixth sense too, is that you also, he, he did show you, he does go back and show you the elements that sort of yeah. give you the clues. Mm-hmm. So, and he does the same thing in, in signs too, right? He mm-hmm. goes back and shows you all the different yes. things that like led up to all the revelations that came before it. Yeah. Um, same thing happened in like um, uh, Glass Onion and um, Knives oh, Out. Oh, right. right? Yes. They do the same thing. They used to tell anything and then you go back and see all the clues that led up to it. Yeah. Uh, Glass Onion, I thought was really weird because he just, they just mm-hmm. took you in one direction and said, nope, that's not what happened. Halfway halfway <laughs> through the, the, the yeah. movie, you're like, you know what's happening. And then literally the next half of the movie is the description of the whodunit. I, I, that was such a surprising format. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Um, uh, but then there are other movies like, um, like Tenet, right? Mm-hmm. You have to watch that movie two or three times to understand what's going on. Yeah. He is a he's a director who will not spare you uh, any stupidity whatsoever at all. If you yeah. don't understand yeah. where Christopher Nolan Inception's is headed. another one, too. You have, yeah, you exactly. have to go back and watch Inception two or three times to I really appreciate movie. it. Yeah, because he doesn't go back and say this is what happened before. Right. Exactly. I, this is what I happens love. at the end love yeah. love love his work i have not seen okay so there would be an, the exception would be the matthew mcconaughey movie that one was just too slow for me to really want to dive back into uh and so i've yeah. never watched it a second time and um i have not seen tenet so i don't know but he i really I did, I did admired, watch interstellar twice just to see if it did. would get any better and it didn't okay so that, that's just a, a, a dud <laughs> we agree yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. So who was it uh, really early on? I was talking with somebody on the podcast who had criticisms of the tree of life with Brad Pitt in it. Um, I saw that movie in theaters early in my marriage. So it's got to be like almost a dozen years ago. And I loved I have not it. Seen that. Oh, I, have I love not it. Seen that. I can't remember the name of the director. He does. It's very, I think to most people's criticism, it's extremely slow moving and not very hooked together. But I think the visuals and the emotion that it it created was worth it to me. So um, let's wrap up. I want to return just a moment too, because I don't, I don't think I got what I needed to get from you out of the conversation of your relationship to, to readers. Uh, So let me, let me close by asking you, what is it like to see a positive review? How long does it stay with you? And what is it like to see a negative review? And how long does that stay with you? Uh, Wow. (laughs) So positive review. So, I mean, it's it's um affirming i think is the best word right okay i did my job i i got the reaction i wanted to get from this book um and it's it's uh, i i can't tell you how long it sticks with me because i haven't died yet right i mean it's like (laughs) everything every positive review i still am clinging to desperately as justification Mm. for going on Mm. so uh, negative reviews uh, i haven't gotten any really like i hated this book type of reviews yet okay um, but I have gotten, you know, where people are like, oh, this, this kind of was kind of plotting. He's like, why is he talking about this guy's Uber ride? It doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, if you actually read the book, you'd see that it pays off later, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. It's like where, and, and this was a, this was, I think a challenge I had early on writing TV. And I think this is another reason too, why my early careers or TV writers sort of immunized me from a lot of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Because when you write a script for TV, you don't just write it and turn it in and they make it. Mm-hmm. It goes through a process, right? It, you, know, the, you get notes and then it goes to the writer's room and everybody picks it apart and replaces jokes with this and that and takes scenes out. And then it goes to the network and they give you ridiculous mm-hmm. notes because they, they need, feel, have a desire to feel needed. <laughs> and then it, when it gets onto the, onto the screen, it's like, you know, you're lucky if like 25, 10% of it is still there from what you wow. were your first draft but it's still yours because you know yeah it's part of the process so that kind of you know experience really sort of inures you to like okay this is not as good as it could be let's make it better mm-hmm. and yeah. so when i get those kinds of notes from people when people say yeah this kind of is slow or what's what's this character doing here or why you mm-hmm. know this really doesn't feel like this character here it's like okay thanks let me fix that yeah. And so I think I, 
I think I get most of my bad reviews before I actually publish. Mm. And I'm, so I'm able to sort of address those things. And you know, I, yeah. again, I, I, I don't always agree with the, the notes I get. I think every writer is like that. Mm-hmm. But I try to address them nonetheless, right? So if somebody has something and they point of view and I'm saying, well, I'm not going to change it, but I am going to sort of fix it mm-hmm. so that I, I don't get that same kind of reaction again, yeah. I hope. Yeah. So, so it's, I think, but all of those, yeah, they, they st- stick with me all the, all the time. It's like yeah. always in the back of my mind. It's like, okay, the, I had this reaction from this type of thing. So let me try that again. Or mm-hmm. I had, you know, people didn't like this part of thing. Or I thought the length, the you know, weird timeline thing did not work. I'm going to stay away from that because I'm not good at that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I'll, I'll let you know if, if it ever falls away, <laughs> but right now, yeah, it just, it, it sticks to you like glue. It's, it's a cumulative, I think it's a cumulative armor, right? The mm-hmm. thing about it is like everybody's feedback is just a little, another little plate in your armor mm-hmm. that you build up and it just makes you stronger and more invulnerable to self-doubt it's than that's what you get. That is, that's fascinating. I, for everybody out there listening right now who identifies with Rich, uh, it's, it's a great moment to hear that. I cannot identify with that even a teeny little bit. I mean, that's so far off from my own experience of positive and negative reviews. Typically a positive review is, is 30 seconds at the max. I'm like, Oh God, that feels really nice. Wow. And then it's just on with business. It's, it's gone. I can't remember what they said. I will remember if I feel like somebody was specific in their positive review and I believe that they liked it versus if somebody gives kind of a generic positive review, I'm like, I don't even know if you read it. Maybe you gave up on it and felt like you were going to be nice, something like that. Um, but man, there was, there was a, a gentleman who took a review copy of my book and uh, came back to me and, and he's, he said, uh, it's a promising start. And I was like, killed i felt (laughs) dead and i know some things about this guy he's he is uh he's a literary reader he came out of university and it it was one of those moments where i was like i'm really scared to go back to the university because even if it's literary quality they're gonna see the fact that it's genre with magic and all that kind of stuff and just assume that it's second rate um you know it took me the better part of a decade to get over the fact that my literary friends all thought Stephen King was a hack just because he didn't write literary enough for them. Nonetheless, though, a promising start for a published book. And I was like, that one, I Brett, I can feel that in the core of me right now. And I'm just wondering, is everybody you know, reading this book thinking it's a promising start? I would take start? that as a positive review, though. That's, I think, that's maybe no the delineation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if somebody said this is a promising start, I'd be like, all oh, right. No way. No, <laughs> I think he meant like it needs like 20 more revisions or something. He he went on to complain about uh, how much Lyle eats. And he's like, that's just impossible. And I was like, right, that's supposed to tip you off to the fact that there's magic coming. But I mean, he was very critical and it's just how he opened, you know, it's a promising start. And I was like, I feel dead right now. I feel dead inside. <laughs> so well, um, I, I think, you know, thinking back, I've, I think I've written reviews like that too, where I like, you know, the, the yeah. book starts out well and it goes in a direction I wasn't expecting or didn't satisfy mm-hmm. my expectations. Yep. And I'll point that yep. out, mm-hmm. and, but I, I, I can't think of any time where I've been like, this book sucks or this writer should mm-hmm. give up or there's nothing redeeming <laughs> in this particular book. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it's 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 not as bad as I am with movies. I mean, I went to see uh, Avatar: Way of Water with my uh, with my son, and he just ripped it to shreds like your wife probably did with uh, yeah. Quantumania. But I, I said I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> that was because I'm just I'm, I'm still blown away by the effects. I'm that yeah. the fact that he spent all this time creating an entirely computer generated world, mm-hmm. uh, interacting with live action characters and all the motion capture stuff, and it's just like. I'm just in awe by the creation of movies in general. But it's like, you know, I've, I've always, I, the first movie I can remember seeing in the theater was uh, Mary Poppins. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a scene where they jump into the chalk drawings. And mm-hmm. in those days, you know, you could stay in the theater and watch the movie a second time. And nobody cared. And so my brothers and, and I just begged our parents, can we just watch it until they jump into the chalk drawings again? Because yeah. it was just like, so it was, I mean, it was like the pinnacle of Disney magic, in my opinion. Yeah. And Dick Van Dyke and, and um, Julie Andrews, it was just like, wow. Yeah. This is, this is magical stuff. And it, ever since then, I just, I love going to the theater, 
love seeing mm-hmm. on the big screen. I'll sit very close. You just let it engulf me completely. Yeah. And the same, the same way with books too. It's like uh, I dive into a book and I like, I can picture the world. I can see mm-hmm. the characters and I just, you know, I want to see what happens to them. And if, if you give me just any small reason to care or want to know what's going to happen next, I'll stick with you for the whole ride. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, if, if somebody told me that, you know, a book had a promising start, I go, okay, great. There we go. <laughs> oh, Rich, that is said. I, I love it. We have done our own character study today on the podcast. I think people know both of us a little bit better than they did coming in. Well, I, I think, I think it, and, uh, this is my theory. It funda- fundamentally boils down to two different types of writers in this world. And mm. it boils down to the whole Oxford comma issue, which I know we disagree uh-huh. on. Yes, absolutely. I'm a, a, a staunch supporter of the Oxford comma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about extraneous stuff in a book, man. Oh, no way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Took the little jab. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay. So again, for people who have not heard you before, because they're just diving into this podcast for the first time, talk about your novels that you have out right now, uh, where you're headed, how they can connect with you. Yeah. The most recent one is Afterlife, Rainy Day Investigation. It's part of a series of paranormal mysteries. Um, I also have a thriller out called The Dead Kids Club. And another book in that genre is coming out later this spring called The Tenth Ride. And then I also have a weekly short story fiction podcast. It's kind of like an anthology multi-genre uh short stories audio format with sound effects and stuff like that it's it it's kind of like my ode to um old time radio right just those sorts of like haunting stories that you can uh, consume in like 20 minutes uh and it's bedtime stories for insomniacs an anthology of those stories is coming out too this spring awesome so you can uh, buy the book as well and they'll have an audio format for that as well but that um if you're at all interested in audiobooks, I hope you will take a listen because it's fun little stories. Uh, some are scary, some are funny, some are mysteries. Um, available on all podcast apps and Audible. And uh, also sign up for my email list there too at bedtimestories.studio. Perfect. I will have all of that as usual linked in the show notes. Uh, thanks for the time today. It was a pleasure, really fun time. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking again. We got to get you on as a, a co-host to do uh, an episode coming up here soon. Looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to TRBM. The theme music was provided by the ever-talented Christopher Talon. And hey, if you liked what you heard, share this show with other readers, because what's the point of telling stories if nobody's listening?